Shall we do attendance today or tomorrow or Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I may please, thank you. There is a, there is a sign in sheet which is being passed around. So, I'll repeat again that the I'll repeat again that the final exam is on May 10th, a Monday morning, uh, Tuesday, Monday, May, whatever it is, May 10th. I don't have the uh, my calendar here. At 10 a.m., I think it's a Monday, Monday morning, 10 a.m. in an hour and 50 minutes, and it's in this room. Okay. The second item is that you'll note that paper two is due on the syllabus next week. We are adding a week, so it is to be due the week of April 19th during your discussion section, the week of April 19th, 21st. So those of you who need extra time, get the extra time. Is that awesome? Yeah. Good. I wish it was so easy to please everyone. Okay. So the papers will be due the week of the 19th and the 21st. And the last walking tour will be on May Day, it says here, May 1st, which is a Friday. I think I've scheduled that one for instead of a Saturday. So give me feedback if you think Saturday is actually easier, but I'd schedule that one for a Friday, thinking that might be easier for folks. The podcasts um, will be, we, our intention is to put them online uh, through last week, the f ones from now forward will not be online, but um, we will try to do that by the end of this week. There's some technology involved, and there will be some, I, we're probably going to be doing it through Blackboard, and I, the university seems to have some concern about permissions still because a lot of, some of the, this has to go through copyright process, so there'll be some kind of sign-off that you'll have to do to access it in which you promise, I think, something like you're firstborn or something like that, whatever the university usually extracts from you. So it'll be something like that. And then you'll have access to the lectures if you want to review the material or if you miss them. Um, are there any questions about all of that? Okay. As I said, there's an attendance sheet that's circulating and you should sign it. As we heard last time, Oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, fragment six of game three, the East Village game. That says St. Anne's Parochial School, 1810. It's the, it's the neighborhood. Those of you who are in the, in the East Village dorms should know that one quite easily. I'll review the others. They're all online. That was the IT company. The dorm fragment. Interior, the heads at the top of a building, part of a church, 
Now we go to Harlem. As we heard last time, the IRT subway opened in 1904, and it collected low, connected sorry, Lower Manhattan with Harlem with a rapid mass transit. We had talked about how the city was often organized around the time it took to walk from one place to, from home to work, and that usually was a 30-minute trek. The subway and mass transit, of course, greatly expanded people's notion of where it was possible to live and get to work. This lecture is actually going to explore the kind of interesting emergence of two iconic areas in New York City, and Manhattan in particular, during this era, and something of the connection between them. The one I'll talk about second is this one, Greenwich Village. But Greenwich Village, as it comes to be understood as a cosmopolitan bohemian center, often the image that NYU markets to attract students here, and it's often the image that does in fact attract students here. The notion that it's in fact quite a distinct kind of place, a place apart both in New York City and even in the rest of the country for experimental and radical arts, politics and lifestyles. Places where you can be engaged in forms of behavior that otherwise would be thought to be unconventional here are the convention. And that emerges really at the turn of the century. It emerges at the same time as Harlem emerges with its modern sense of self. In particular, again, as an iconic African-American community associated with poverty and with a concentration of, boundary, of bounded air, a concentration, a density of African-Americans in a bounded community. We begin with Harlem. You'll remember that the term itself, of course, is Dutch. So Harlem has a much older history. Its modern meaning and configuration is what we mean to talk about today. The eight, early in the 19th century, before the Civil War, it va the area vacillated between, with between 9,000 and 15,000 people. It was perhaps 1% of the city's population lived up there. So it really was a place pretty much apart. It was an isolated, semi-isolated rural village. The gradual abolition of slavery. Remember, we talked about manumission, where people could free their slaves upon their death. Slave owners could free their slaves upon their death. And the gradual abolition even in New York City, so that slavery ceases to exist only in 1826. actually July 4th, 1827, means that the area in the north is associated as much with free as sla black slaves. But the black population, in fact, after the freedom of slaves, declines in Harlem and in the city. It's in 1820, it's at a peak of some 10,368, according to the census. And it remains virtually stable, slowly declining, but only infinitesimally, not statistically very significant. In 1865, it's 9,943, the entire black community in Manhattan. This is data not just for Harlem, for all of Manhattan. The point is to note that this is a period in which the population of Manhattan was skyrocketing. So the African-American community is remaining virtually stagnant and becoming a smaller and smaller share of the population. Of that population, however, the African-American population remains among the poorest. It required, at that time, to vote franchise, required a $250 freehold, which was a lot of money. If you remember, that would have been the equivalent of a year's salary for a working man who had little skill. Only 44 blacks in the city, African Americans in the city, had the franchise at the end of the Civil War. So it was a remarkably poor population. And during this period, the African-American population does not live in Harlem. It lives mostly in southern Manhattan, associated with the Five Points area, in a particular community often known as Stag Town or Negro Plantation. And after the war, 
begins slowly to move south to the to, north, rather, to south the southern part of Greenwich Village. Bleecker Street, Thompson Street, McDougal, Sullivan Street, the streets just south of Washington Square Park. Okay? The streets just south of Washington Square Park. On the whole, what we know is a pattern that's not unfamiliar today, that they were often living there partially by choice and partially by confinement, in the sense that this were the, these were the areas, the poorest areas in town, the areas where they could afford to live, but also areas where no one else wanted to live near them. These were areas in which they are increasingly associated with low status, even though at the same time there were occasions in which they could be exoticized. That's to say, they could be seen as people who, for whom others had a kind of fascination with them as long as they were kept at a safe distance. This would be seen in the fascination with uh, the black dancer Juba, who did a kind of tap dance and black, black dance that we would associate with the origins of jazz dancing, even prior to the Civil War in southern Manhattan. Outsiders call these areas, and again, the names are suggestive of kind of how they were treated, Coon Town and Nigger Alley, terms that they did not self-define themselves as. These were terms that were meant to be, in fact, terms of low status, terms that stigmatized them. Freedom, that's to say, which they had after 1865, did not mean an end to discrimination. It did not mean an end to stigmatization. And it did not mean an end to hatred. And as we know, even as we talk about economic development, cultural development, flourishing subcultures of ethnic communities, racism remains a kind of underbelly of social life in New York City. Early marking off one group's ability to blame others. And while the people at the lowest part of that totem pole were African Americans, we all remember how that kind of racialized discourse was applied to ethnic groups who were thought to be not quite white folk. We, you've all heard the term a black, the black Irish, for instance, as a way of associating the Irish with African American culture when, they, when someone wanted to criticize them or treat them as low status or presume they were not as good as everybody else as Anglo-Saxon Protestant white folk. And there was, of course, a great deal of anti-Catholic hostility. Nativism, which is rampant in the last half of the 19th century, was not simply about racism. It was profoundly anti-Catholic and would become anti-Semitic. And both are very large communities, Catholics and Jews in New York City. So we're talking really about communities coexisting and often feeling vulnerable and often using their vulnerability to try to elevate themselves against people who were not much better off than themselves. So it's a quite sad story often that we're telling here. The occupations of the African Americans were largely what you would have expected. They were janitors, they were domestics, they were the worst paid and the lowest status jobs. After 1880, things begin to change a bit, though not in their jobs. It's, it's the profile of the African American community. Blacks begin to move out of the area south of, in the South Greenwich Village, largely because Italians are moving in and pushing them out. Italians trying to have upward mobility and increase the size of Little Italy are moving north in Greenwich Village, and they move into this area south of Greenwich Village. And the black population that was there, which is now increasingly going to be augmented by blacks moving in from the south, begin to look for new places to live, and they're forced to move even further north, further away from jobs, to, again, places where land was cheaper and housing was more plausible. They scatter to the blocks, to the east and to the west, 
and they move in six different wards. They're scattered about the city. But in particular, they move to two or three areas that we know. One is an area, again, the names are illustrative, the Tenderloin. A piece of nice raw meat, as the term suggests, was meant to suggest a kind of area, not just of low life, but an area of fast life. It was a red light district north of Tin Pan Alley that extended from 20th Street up as far as 53rd Street. It becomes initially the kind of Negro, as the term was used then, Negro Bohemia, with black vaudeville, minstrel shows, again, the legacy of Juba from the 1840s that we talked about. Some move even further north to an area that's known as San Juan Hill, especially after 1898, Spanish-American War, that's the area, some of you know, 60th to 64th Street between 10th and 11th Avenue where there was a small rise. They moved to that area. This becomes a kind of multiracial area that includes increasingly some early Latino settlements, but substantially this new African-American push. The social conditions of this black community and the social profile changes as they're beginning to move. First of all, there are new opportunities for work for women. Racism, as we've talked about, one has to remember, is gendered. And men were generally seen as more threatening than women, especially by white men. White men tended to fear or take out their animosity about black men. They were much more willing to poach black women obviously race narratives, rape narratives. New York City has four black men for every five black women, so there are also more black women moving there. Male wages were so low that twice as many black women often work to help families survive as women in other communities. In other words, Black women worked at a rate twice that of women in other ethnic communities, usually in families, to support, to provide what we would call a family wage because the male breadwinner salary was so low. To give you a sense of that, 59% of black women worked, where on the average, 27, this is again at the turn of the century, said 27.2% of foreign-born women worked and 24.6% of white women. Okay. Worth keeping all of this in mind, this figure about the gendering of race, because of a of social policy in the 19, early 1970s associated with another New Yorker, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. We're sufficiently going to laud him that we're going to, they're hoping to name new post office, rail station, after him. Moynihan was a Harvard sociologist who then becomes a senator, a politician, who writes a very powerful and influential book in the 1960s that informs the policy um, that's a kind of backlash to the war on poverty in the 60s. It's the 1970s policy. He becomes an advisor to Richard Nixon after 1968 and writes a book about the black family in which he argues that the pervasive po po um, poverty of the black family is due to the pathology of the black community. The data that we have since then suggests, in, in fact, that what had marked the black family were patterns of racism and discrimination that went back as far as the Civil War era and were marked by, by a world of industrial capitalism that provided jobs for some people, that made discriminations about who to hire and who not to hire. And that profoundly influenced the work of African-American scholars like Eugene Genovese and Herb Gutman, who have written kind of powerful critiques of this Moynihan um, analysis. But we get ahead of ourselves. It's really just to forewarn you of where that story will, the implications of this kind of analysis or question about the origins of black poverty and the black family. 92% of black labor 
in an era in which industrial capitalism is opening up new jobs all the time for everyone, is not opening up new jobs for them all the time of the same quality. 92% of the jobs in black labor are menial jobs. Below those of a day labor, they were jobs, they were no longer slaves, but they remained in service. They were servants, they were porters, they were waiters, they were laundresses, they were janitors. They had a higher mortality than any other group in New York City. The mortality in 1890, African Americans, was 37.5 per 1,000 in New York City. Among whites, it was 28.5. Infant mortality was twice as high as white levels. Even with those horrific condi social conditions, however, you'd expect that African Americans would want to keep their distance from New York City. But in truth, just the opposite takes place. Even as these conditions remain as poor as they are, African Americans are moving into New York City in record numbers during exactly this period. The black population in New York City increases 50 percent between 1900 and 1910. In one decade it increases 50 percent. Remember we were talking about a number that was around 10,000 even after the Civil War. By 1910 it's almost 92,000. Why are they coming if conditions are so terrible? Well, like the story we've talked about in terms of immigration, of rags to riches, part of the story is to understand, well, how bad was it where they came from? It's the narrative not just of pull, but of push. Things could be attracting them, though we've just suggested not a whole lot, but other things could be pushing them. And indeed, with the end of Reconstruction, Jim Crow South was not a very friendly place for African Americans. The racism in New York was preferable. 61% of the newcomers fled the South. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida in particular. New York City becomes the second largest urban center in the United States. Anyone want to guess the first? It's Washington, D.C. Philly is the fifth and Chicago is the eighth. By 1920, okay, a decade later, New York City will be number one, and Philadelphia will be number two, and Chicago will be number four, Washington number three. So within this decade, New York's black population is, to use a skyrocketing. Again, why did they leave? The Jim Crow South, where people were being hung, strung up, terrorized, and black men in particular, and black women were the subject of race, of rape, I'm sorry, of rape. And if they did not themselves experience rape or hanging, they knew someone who did. Those bodies were left hanging from trees to be seen. Does that remind you of something from 1741, you may recall, how these communities often use this to terror. Other communities are doing this. We see this happening in Iraq and Afghanistan today, um, that people do this to terrorize communities. Increasingly, what do these people do? Migratory laborers are coming to the north. They had been coming for a long time, but now they decide to stay. They've been coming here to pick crops during the summer months, and they stay. And they come because there is an attraction, the hope of industrial jobs. And industrial jobs were opening up. We talked about garments as an example. Do they get jobs in the garment industry? No, but they are opening up those jobs. They can find jobs in other industries, famously in Chicago, in meatpacking. In New York and in northern cities, they will increasingly, however, find jobs as America goes to war and working men enlist 
and blacks who are discriminated against in the armed forces as well as in the industrial workplace are welcomed in to take, to take jobs during industry. That, by the way, will result in a, again, to bring us a little ahead of ourselves, but for some of you in the papers that you're writing, it will result in riots all over the country in 1919 when soldiers come back and suddenly want their jobs back. They want their homes back and they find that blacks either have their jobs or are living in the communities. And we have race riots in city after city in America as well as major labor strikes because these people hold jobs, wages had fallen and industrialists come back. So it's good. 1919 becomes a cataclysmic year around issues around race and class in our cities. It's shaped by these new opportunities, opening things up, but also in opening them up, changing the calculus of social relations in the city. New York City is also a place where some come because it had the reputation as the center of black philanthropy. Some of the major African-American institutions in America were in the South, like the Tuskegee Institute, but the boards of trustees for these institutions were in New York City. It's not unlike the pattern we talked about in absentee ownership of white wealth. So the operations could be elsewhere, but they're run from the people of wealth in the city, in New York. So the boards of trustees of the Tuskegee Institute of the Phelps Stoke Foundation, of the Armstrong Association, which was associated with the Hampton Institute, all of these new places for education for blacks and for what was called uplift for blacks. The notion that you're creating moral, better moral people were rooted in New York City. There was also, that's to say, a small elite middle class, a black middle class in New York City, often known as the Talented Tenth. F perhaps as many as 450 well, relatively well-to-do African Americans. Well-to-do meant above poverty, not living in poverty. They were musicians. They were actors. They were clergy. They were small businessmen, emphasis on small. Do you know what kind of businesses blacks ran? The primary form of business that blacks would run? Anyone want to guess? Might be. The kind of business that would only serve, they were barbers, black barbers. So community after community, that's the form of entrepreneurship for African Americans. It's the barbershop. There were 42 physicians and 26 black lawyers as well in the city. They tend to promote either one of three strategies, this middle class, either uplift, black separation, which will be moving to Libya, or to try to organize the blacks into a political force. And we'll see all of that in a minute. Where will they live is the question. Where is this black population going to live? Well, they're arriving just as, voila, the subway has a place to take them. It opens up Harlem. And it's coincident with the migration north. Harlem. Again, 17th century settlement. Blacks have been there as slaves. The Dutch West India Company had built the wagon road up there. There was a Negro burial ground there. The 1790 census had 115 slaves there, which was a third of the population. So there were 450 people at the, open, at the birth of the American Republic. There were 450 people living in this village. 1904 changes it, and it's done with speculative investment. The rail line, when it opens to this particular area, sets off a mania of possible settlement and therefore housing. Real estate speculation is mobilized in particular by the equitable and met life insurance companies that begin to invest in building tenements and apartment buildings. The southern area of Harlem, below 125th Street, becomes an area in which Jews begin to, leave, begin to move. They would pass through there for a few years, trying to leave the Lower East Side. 
try to escape the Lower East Side, they would eventually go to the Grand Concourse in Bronx. Just the idea of it being a Grand Concourse suggests that it was a place um, that was mean, meant to have some kind of social status rather than the Lower East Side. When they went there, the Jews found they weren't always so welcome because they were living in an area that bordered on where the Germans had been and the German Jews. And the Jews who settled there often found that they were not so welcome. Signs were out, keine Juden und keine Hund. No Jews, no dogs. Not unlike no blacks, no, no Irish need apply. So the Jews were not always so welcome and they were quick to move out as well. Luxury apartment houses are built in West Harlem along 7th Avenue in the 130s and the 140th Street area becomes a Negro Harlem, as it's called. These new buildings are luxury buildings with elevators, maids rooms, pantries, all built on the assumption not that blacks would move there, but that rich folks would move there. Okay. This area was being opened up with the assumption that cheap land to build on, let's build luxury apartments and let's have white folks move up into the area. The speculation meant that the prices and the rents increased. And just as these buildings are built and finished, the subway opens up and there's an economic bust. There's a housing bust. The collapse of the housing market between 1903 and 1905. There are too many apartments and too few rich people who can afford the high rents. However, as most of you know, depression causes opportunities for some people. McDonald's and Burger Kings do very well. Fast food franchises do very well. High-end restaurants don't do so well. So somebody's misery is often someone else's gain. And that was the opportunity that opened up here for a Negro realtor, an African-American realtor in particular, by the name of Philip A. Payton, Jr. P-A-Y-T-O-N, Philip Payton, Jr. And he opens and starts the African-American Realty Company. And he decides to, t to try to buy this new housing and when the glut of housing, he can buy it relatively cheaply, and he decides he will make it available to New York City's new black population. Peyton calls this project of his race enterprise. Race enterprise. He decides he's going to take these luxury buildings, buildings built as luxury apartments. That's, by the way, why they're so attractive and people are now rebuilding them now or renovating them. They were built initially to be luxury buildings. They're quite handsome. Go up and take a look. Peyton leases the apartment houses from the Harlem's white owners and assures them that he will get them an annual rental income more than they would get by leaving the places vacant. So his job now is to fill them with people who can pay the rent. They, of course, can't afford them, can't afford to rent the whole place, so he divides the units into multifamily units. But there are houses that were built with one kitchen, one bathroom, with bedrooms and parlors. They weren't built as multifamily housing. So he gerrymanders the arrangement. They're never ideal for multifamily, and they're now being operated as tenant houses. For blacks, however, oh, he also decides that he's going to increase the rent for blacks by charging 10% over the market value, and that will allow him to give the white owners the rents back, the, the, the money back that, they, that he had promised them. So the blacks are moving there, but they're being asked to pay 10% above what the market is. So why do they do so? Well, they're paying 10% of a part of a building. And so it's 10% over, but it's a small apartment, and they can afford it. And it gives them a better place to live than where they had been living before. For blacks, it's an opportunity to move into luxury housing. That's to say, places that were made well, even if they weren't made to be lived in in that way. So he, the grand flats are divided with multiple families. And doubling up was an old working class strategy, as you may recall. When you're impoverished, you take in borders, families live together. So this was not an unusual 
configuration for poor people to expect. Peyton's company dissolves after four years when he's charged with misrepresentation to the people he's selling. But he, in those four years, had opened up conditions for what historians who have studied this area call effectively, the term that they use is a book by the name, by a man named, by the name of Gilbert Osofsky called Harlem, The Making of a Ghetto, a term that, we've, that came to have a very particular kind of meaning in the 19th century as a place in, in America associated with poor African American communities that were bonded. It obviously had other kinds of bonded meanings of ghettos in Eastern Europe as well. But again, the same notion of being confined, bounded, and impoverished, contained, and subjected. How does he see this? Becoming ghettoized, becoming this kind of process. Well, white realtors and mortgage companies took over the area, and whites begin to leave in large numbers. Between 1920 and 1930, to give you a notion, we have the beginnings of what we might call white flight, a phenomenon that we'll pick up after World War II. So after each world war, as large numbers of whites are coming back to America, having fought in the war, having fought and now demand the, the rights they believe owe to them as citizens, as people who have fought patriotically for their country, they find themselves now living in cities next to people of low status, and they say, we want out. So white flight begins in the 20s out of Harlem, out of these areas built for luxuries. To give you an example, in 1920 to 1930, 119,000 whites leave, and over 87,000 blacks arrive into the community. It's a process of displacement. The community is being blackened, as it were. And it's a community that is becoming increasingly impoverished. The rents are high, but the key piece to remember is that their jobs remain low with low wages. These are people who never find new opportunities after the war. They, always find the, they are always at the bottom of the economic totem pole when it comes to job possibilities. And they don't have enough often to pay these wages, so they're constantly doubling up, tripling up, their wives working, their children working. Mo living in multiple households in buildings that were not built to be used that way. The other difference, of course, is they're not owners, they're renters. There's no personal investment in the building, no personal investment in the housing especially if they feel they're being, having rents that are being extracted above the market value. So to survive, they resort to an underground economy. They begin to find other ways of making do. We saw this in five points. Remember, we talked about an underground economy, collecting firewood, rag picking, okay? gambling. Well, here we have the same thing, only it's an era of prohibition. So one of the ways in which you make money is by bootlegging. By doing something, by, by participating in what would be called economic readjustment. You probably just call it stealing. And that's what it was from the white perspective. We might just call it economic readjustment. Family instability emerges with female-headed households increasingly. Unemployed blacks, males. And increasingly by mid-century, that was going to lead to a lot of these black males feeling low status in a patriarchal culture where women now are taking on the role of breadwinners. This was going to lead to people turning to other forms of ways of satisfying themselves. And cocaine addiction, we know by mid-century becomes a major problem for young black men in these communities. And the trafficking of drugs, some of which they come and sell to college students in Washington Square Park, as you well know, 60s. Today, in fact, this story, its present configuration is 
and again I mean it just for you to have some segue into the present, is to think of it really about the emergence of the prison industrial complex in New York State, in which we have young black and Hispanic men overwhelmingly filling the prison system, which is located mostly in white rural areas, in which poor white men, the only jobs they can find is as guards guarding poor black men who are no longer living near their community, but are in all these upstate prisons. So that it's estimated that at any given moment in time, one of three young black men in, cities, in, in states like New York are in relationship to the criminal justice system because of this condition of poverty. So what we effectively have emerging out of this pattern are social divisions which complicate the ability of, to create a black unified working class. But nonetheless, and that's complicated even more by the fact that blackness takes on much more complexity. By the 30s, we have the movement into this area of Afro-Caribbeans in large numbers with different customs, mores, and desires than African Americans. And many of them are hired more quickly than their African American mates. So Jamaican blacks, for instance, Barbadians find much easier access into the job community even than African Americans often did in these communities. So blackness isn't always, a, a, while they, everybody from outside can see the entire community as black, from inside it's often quite, it can even be quite divided. And even more divided when the Latino community comes in, which is often a mestizo community that sometimes identifies as black and sometimes as white. 15,000 Puerto Ricans are in this area by 1930, and they will come in large numbers after World War II, again complicating this story. 40,000, the period just before the war, living in this area are from the West Indies. In addition, they have all within the community different strategies and attitudes about what we might say, to, to inherit the phrase from, uh, from V.I. Lenin, what is to be done? Right. How are we to deal with these conditions? How are we to make our lives better? How are we to deal with racism? And they didn't have one answer. They divided quite profoundly on the answer. For some, they turn to the writings of, shaped by Booker T. Washington and his followers, what has been called the gospel of the toothbrush. That's to say separatism. Stay separate until and uplift ourselves until it was an acknowledgement that we are behind the rest of the white society. We're not yet ready to take their jobs. We have to prepare ourselves to be integrated in society. And the way to do that is to separate ourselves out and go and get vocational training. The, at the places like the Tuskegee Institute and Washington is, of course, the founder of that. Self-help vocational schools. The alternative to that was represented by the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, there was a Du Bois Club in, uh, at CUNY, at City University of New York in the 1960s. And uh, I was involved, I, or I had organized a march on Washington in the mid-60s, and at one point, uh, I was in touch with the people there, and they were getting involved, and uh, Richard Nixon complained about that organization because he said they had, they, were defaming, they, had taken, they were taking the name of the Boys Clubs of America. He didn't understand that Du Bois was D-U, capital B-O-I-S. It was not the Boys, it was Du Bois. <laughs> but some of our presidents are smarter than others on some things, I suppose, or whatever. We all, we, we, we all like to be given some space. The Du Bois Club, Du Bois, founds the NAACP, but he is a socialist. He, in fact, is a, so is a, is a Harvard sociologist, one of the most influential intellectuals of the 20th century. He later moves, some of you, uh, lives all through this area, and he writes about integration. He proposes that blacks deserve full integration into the society. It's a kind of reverse of black radicalism in the 60s in which separatism becomes the more radical position. At this period of time, 
the more radical position was the Du Bois demanding now we should, we should have our rights now in integration or separation. Harlem institutions, so they disagree about those strategies. The Harlem institutions also emerge, however, in the 1920s. That would become the basis for African-American mus political muscle in America. They have their roots in several cities, but prominently in New York City. First of all, the church. The black church had been a powerful tool for black organization, and the songs that came out of those churches helped to build solidarity both in their message and in the common singing that buoyed people's spirits and reminded them of the hardships and struggles that we shall overcome, as the song suggested. The black church in New York, of course, was the, and, and Harlem was the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And its family dynasty was begun in the 20s with its minister, Adam Clayton Powell. And Adam Clayton Powell Sr. and then Jr. would remain major political figures coming out of the black church in America from the 1920s forward. The YWCA organizes in Harlem, and it should be noted that I said WCA. The YMCA is one of America's more racist institutions. The YWCA was a feminist, multiracial institution. And that remains true right through the 70s and 80s, that the YWCA and the MCA are very different organizations. It is the largest of those Ys in the United States is in Harlem. And it becomes powerful as a multiracial, integrated institution, an organization. There are Harlem visiting nurses in the 1920s, 25 to 30 of them, coming out of the settlement house movement. And Harlem begins tuberculosis and community clinics to deal with the pervasive health problems that remain to this day markers of the poverty of Harlem and distinct distinctiveness of the ways in which that community is treated. It is an urban ecological disaster relative to the rest of the city and remains so to this day. Finally, by the 1920s, the emergence in Harlem of something we call the Harlem Renaissance. That's to say, we've talked about the impoverishment of Harlem. We've talked about how Harlem gets impoverished. Yet we've suggested that through all of that impoverishment, there is a vital community that is struggling to hold itself together and organize itself and nurture its political aspirations. One needs to know as well that there is a vibrant culture in this community, and that culture comes to be understood by some white folks as well. And it becomes known as the Harlem Renaissance. It begins in, with the end of World War I, 1919, and continues into the 1930s with a profound effect on African American diasporic political culture. Here, even the Caribbean black culture in London is shaped by it. Jazz. Today it would be hip hop. It reaches its zenith in Harlem from 1925 to 29. It is the, something that is known as the New Negro associated with the Jazz Age, with the Cotton Club, with speakeasies, again, with that marginal semi-legal culture, with jazz, with exotica. Famous writers, poets, musicians, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, Nora Zeal Hurston, and people like Du Bois. All are in that area helping to nurture the origins of a vital African-American culture that feeds into white music later on as well, of course. It's not simply separate all the time. Because, in fact, white folk were going up to Harlem increasingly in the 1920s and 30s in order to celebrate the emergence of a culture among a people who are discriminated against. And the group of people who lead that march up to Harlem to view its renaissance, and Harlem itself was not economically in any renaissance. This is a cultural renaissance. The people who lead that struggle, that, that movement, that migration, come from Greenwich Village. The coincident rise of a New York City radical Bohemia, 
is part of a formula that allows Harlem, in fact, to be made visible as the center of a renaissance. Because as a radical Bohemia, they both are prepared to give a critique of racism and they're paired, prepared to celebrate an alternative culture that they see being nurtured in Harlem at the same time. The village, as it comes to be known, as an appealing artsy-fartsy neighborhood, comes from middle-class folks who moved there after 1900. We're talking about a new kind of white-collar labor force. It was a fictive community associated with the new keywords of the era. In other words, it wasn't something that just existed in bonds. It comes to have a set of meanings to people as a bounded area, as a place to go. And that meaning, after by the 20s, will become a byword to young girls in Minneapolis and young men in Kansas City, all deciding that they want a chance to play music or make it on Broadway or go to the theater. And it becomes associated with moving to New York with the politics of the city. The new key word, these are people who see themselves as Bohemians, as in Paris and Vienna, who see themselves as not simply New Yorkers, but as cosmopolitans, not just metropo metropolitans, but cosmopolitans, intellectuals and feminists, and socialists and communists, and anarchists, all embracing the possibilities of taking on alternative and oppositional cultural forms and political forms and suggesting there could be a relationship between cultural and political forms, which in the 1960s would be encapsulated in the slogan, the personal is the political. Its origins around 1910 to World War I are among a group of newcomers in New York. That was your Adam Clayton Powell, by the way, senior. This is one of the men who will be most influential in the shaping, in the imagining of New York because he's a journalist who will write about it. Some of you have seen the movie about his life, Reds with Warren Beatty. You can go back and see it. It's a fun Hollywood production. These people are a alternative creating a cultural and political alternative to established cultural elite that lives uptown and to an established economic elite that works downtown. And they're occupying this middle ground. And it's actually a middle intellectual, financial, and political ground. It's a physical middle ground. The village is between Wall Street on the one hand and the Silk Stocking District, on the other hand. It's midway between the devil and the deep blue sea. Pick your pick. I'm not sure which is which. They infuse this new area with the politics of the left and give it a cultural dimension. They are gathering what they began, what began among a small group and a growing group. And remember, we have 150,000 people marching in the streets against the Triangle Shirtwaist fire and disaster. So there was a lot to fuel popular feelings that something was not quite right. Okay? And it's happening again in the village, Triangle around the corner. So there was a lot at work here. Great things could attract people from the captains of industry or robber barons, but there was this counter narrative emerging on the streets of New York. Kathy Pice gives you some sense of that emerging. Some people begin to feel that what's happening to the north of this area and the south was materialistic and crass. And they try to create an artistic culture that informs intense forms of sociability in conversation, in friendships, in sexual mores, in taking over the streets and suggesting that women can be out on the streets, young girls, and not simply be prostitutes. That you can go to places and act out in masquerade forms of behavior that wouldn't be allowed elsewhere. 
the sense of carnival, the carnivalesque that you see at uh, Coney Island, which I'm told from Huffington Post yesterday, a developer is rebuilding in it with uh, about 45 new first-class rides, hopefully in all of our lifetime. The village in Bohemia becomes this liminal space to leap people across the divide between the conservative business banker condescension of the poor, as they saw it, and the hostility that they saw coming to immigrants, the hostility that they saw um, coming to working class people, and racism. These bohemian radicals try to create a world that could imagine a new culture, a new woman, not just the new Negro. But this term also gets created during this decade, and it gets created out of radical feminists in the city, the new woman who begins to emerge. She's a woman who would be serious and independent. She would have a, like a new man who might be her partner, a new temper of mind in favorite subjects that will echo back to Fanny Wright in the 18. 20s and early 1830s in New York City. It goes back that far. Free speech, free love, and free expression. Pretty radical ideas. We'll come back to read in a minute. The leading figures are photographers like Alfred Stieglitz, painters like Georgia O'Keeffe, John Sloan from the Again, think of the term the ash can school, the idea of celebrating as art something you would call an ash can, trying to turn everything on its head in terms of ideas. Make what is the prosaic is as meaningful in its art form as what's seen as high art. Margaret Sanger, the birth control movement. Eugene O'Neill, the Provincetown players around the corner. Isadora Duncan, the barefoot dancer, wearing those dresses that scandalized New York because they were, people thought you might see too much through them. John Reed, the journalist. Emma Goldman, a radical anarchist. Walter Lippmann, some of you know the journalist. Randolph Bourne, Claude McKay, Max Eastman, Mabel Dodge. I'll come to some of these figures in America in a minute. They come out of the 1890s of underground magazines that began to emerge, like Mademoiselle New York, paralleled in, New in London by the Yellow Book with Oscar Wilde. It's basically the equivalent to the world of Oscar Wilde and the, the fin de siècle that had emerged in, was emerging in London, in Paris. It's a comparable bohemia that's seeing itself part of a transatlantic, in that sense, cosmopolitan. People are, in New York, these people are saying, we're not just citizens of the city or of the state, we're citizens of a world culture. It begins the birth of what, what might begin to call a certain kind of cosmopolitan internationalism in attitudes not just strident nationalism that the nativists would have embraced. They're animated by the labor struggles in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Patterson, we talked about the Patterson pageant at Madison Square Garden. Later they'd be animated by the Russian Revolution. John Reed and Emma Goldman both end up in Russia. Reed buried there. And they come here, a large number of them, from Harvard, where they had created a socialist school, a society, society rather, and then like Reed and Walter Lippmann all moved to New York City. They meet here Jewish radical intellectuals like Goldman and Stieglitz. They encounter the Jewish, the Yiddish Rialto on Second Avenue with poetry, painting, drama, and they begin to elaborate a very different vision about the city, not as a place of danger. And remember, there's a pervasive, and very important for you to understand, that in American history generally, there is a pervasive national anti-urban set of attitudes that exist as national policy. 
They come out of notions that from uh, white Protestant Anglo-Saxon culture that suggests that Americans were born on the frontier and in the wilderness and we tamed the wilderness and that the hero of America was the farmer who cultivates the land. Whereas cities were full of immigrants, they were full of bad ideas inherited from Europe that need to be cleansed by moving out into the countryside, into the land, where all that purple mountains majesty and fruited plains can somehow cleanse us. Cities were seen as evil places. That's why George, who was it, uh, Gerald Ford could so easily tell Amer New York City to drop dead in 1976 before giving it money. That was an old policy reflected. What this is suggest, so in, and in fact, remember, reformers always had notions if you want to deal with people who were poor, you create something called a retreat, a retreat from the city. You take people who are having a hard time, poor kids, what do we do with them in the summer? You ship them off into the countryside. What did reformers want to do, in fact, with poor kids? They wanted to put them in a train and send them out to rural families where they could be adopted and taken over. Take them away from their mothers and their fathers because the mothers and fathers were immigrants who were going to not train them well and had nothing but poverty. The idea was the notion, breathe fresh air and it will make you free. Fresh air camps, we call them, right? We have things called fresh air funds, sponsored by the New York Times to this day every year. It's all of that notion. If they want to see problems about fresh air, they might do something about tuberculosis in Harlem. Okay, clean air. What we have among these radicals is the notion that the city is not a place of disease, it's a place of intellectual fer ferment. It is in fact a place where ideas are made, that the most interesting ideas are being created in the city. That it's being created by encounter, that encounter isn't danger, encounter is intellectual engagement. They have a complicated relationship to the Jews, and rather than being anti-Semitic, this bohemia begins to filter out some attitude, strains of anti-Semitism, at the same time as there are other strains that are beginning to creep into early anthropology and eugenics at the same time. So they're not, it's not as if all anti-Semitism disappears from the intellectual world. There's a lot of it actually being developed at the same moment. But within some of bohemia, at least, there's a kind of peace being made with Jewish intellectuals in this area as well. Politics and art are in a heated dialogue over endless cups of coffee and tea in cafes. What's the best strategy? Is it socialism or is it anarchism? Is it Zionism? What is the woman's question they're all asking suddenly? What is this new thing called the labor question? And how is it to be settled? Should we Abolish the state? Should we create a trade union? Should we build our own political party? Should we have, should we try to enter the unions that exist and create, take them over, get involved in them, change what's going on? They arguing all the time about what's the appropriate strategy and they violently disagreed with one another. They spend more time, half the time I will acknowledge, fighting with one another than fighting with anybody else from the outside. That's unfortunately part of the history of the left community here as they eat their young. They tend to eat themselves in much of these conflicts. Two representative figures are worth talking about a little bit. The first is Mabel Dodge. She's an heiress from Buffalo. She returns to New York City in 1912 after three years in Italy where she was married for a time to an architect. While in Italy, she had become a solinière. That's to say she was a woman who ran a salon. A kind of a gathering at one's home to bring together intellectuals over coffee or tea or wine or other things that might encourage the inflated consciousness in order to talk about ideas. She was a sexually ambiguous femme fatale. 
That's to say she was both attractive, but it wasn't always clear to whom she was always attractive. And she deliberately blurs those kinds of lines because in part they're calling into question, what does it mean to be a woman? They're challenging that old ideology about the cult of true womanhood that was elevating women from, their, from this radical perspective in order to imprison them, in order to make them subservient to male authority, and arguing that the new woman was a woman unto herself. She should have her own rights. She might even, preposterous as this might seem, be allowed to vote. And they don't until the end of this period, of course. And then they often, the women would prove that they could vote just as badly as the men. But for now, they want to argue they can vote. She was a sexually ambiguous femme fatale, but she, and she entertained aesthetes, artists, and intellectuals at her villa. She moves to New York City and sets up her own salon here. She be, develops a friendship with Gertrude and Leo Stein when she had been in Paris. She had known them at Harvard or right when she was at Radcliffe, and she gets an invite to the new Armory show, which was the coming out party at the new Armory for Modern Art in New York City, for the notion that there's a whole new way of even thinking about what is thought to be aesthetically interesting, what is constituted as the beautiful. Need it be representational to be true? It was to suggest, in fact, that truth is not something that necessarily looks like a marble with nice hard edges, but truth looks like a marshmallow. It often has gray edges at the loose, can be soft and mushy. And that was a fairly radical idea. It's a struggle that remains to this day. She sponsors the Patterson pageant, and then with this weekly salon, brings in radical intellectuals and artists, and she becomes the doyen for free speech in New York. She's bisexual, though later marries and founds an artist community in Taos, New Mexico. So modern Taos, New Mexico, that many of you know is an artist community, comes from Mabel Dodge, the New Yorker, moving out there to create another artistic community when the one here is not always found to be well appreciated. Why free speech, you might ask? Important to remember that the industrial workers of the world the radical anarcho-syndicalists, who I will tell you a little bit about next time, their most radical proposition, besides the abolition of the wage system and things like that, their strategy was to demand free speech. It was to demand the right to stand up on a soapbox at any corner and say outrageous things about capitalism and the state. And city after city was passing laws forbidding free speech during this period. So the campaign for free speech, which was focused against radical anti-capitalists, helped to mobilize a radical campaign on behalf of something that seems at face value not to be terribly radical, free speech. It was a centerpiece of the campaign and struggle for ideas during these first two decades. The second person mentioned, closing, is Emma Goldman. She becomes the emblem for free speech in the country. She's actually born in Lithuania of Orthodox parents and moves to the Lower East Side in the early 1880s. She's part of that East European Jewish migration. She early makes, up her, makes a reputation for herself as a soapbox orator on behalf of the poor. The assassination of President McKinley in 1901 by someone who is an avowed anarchist makes her a byword for the foreign menace because she is an avowed anarchist. The person who shot this person is, uh, in McKinley was of a very different stripe and character. This was not something uh, anar anarchists on the whole were not advocating violence. They were advocating the end of the state. They were advocating as an alternative to the state the creation of trade unions. In particular, one big, that everyone would be in a large trade union, a kind of collective cooperative trade union. But 
Anarchism was not terribly well understood and came in different stripes. She becomes associated with the, with the anarchist menace in America. She's forced to live as a, on a, with a pseudonym. She moves to Fifth Avenue and 18th Street, where she operates a facial and massage parlor for women. The revolution in Europe of 1905, which is a kind of socialist struggles in the factories in Eastern Europe, and her oratorial, oratorical struggle, uh, uh, skills increase her reputation on the left as a voice, as the voice of the alternative political culture. She, however, becomes the champion in that political culture of modern dance, which made her, of course, very dangerous. Modern drama, another very dangerous thing to oppose. Free love, we know that didn't get you very far. Homosexuality and the martyrs of the labor movement back from the Haymarket Massacre. She self-identifies not just as an anarchist, but equally important as a feminist, a, as a militantly anti-capitalist ally of the most radical labor organization, the Industrial Workers of the World, which forms in 1905 as well. And she lectures across the United States. She is, in fact, deported with her partner, Alexander Berkman, to Russia after the Red Scare, after the Palmer Raids of 1918. Many of you know that you often associate um, what we call McCarthyism and the Red Scare with the period after World War II. In fact, the first Red Scare is after World War I. So we've already talked about what happens in terms of white flight after World War I. We've talked about certain kinds of cultural Struggles after World War I, there are all kinds of parallels between forces set, it, set loose after the tremendous transformation represented by these wars. And a Red Scare is another one. Okay. She's deported and dies ultimately in Spain in 1940. So in the wake of World War I and the Russian Revolution, with the portion the deportation of Goldman and the other radicals, nonetheless, the village as an idea, as a place associated with the new idea, had become established. And the Harlem Renaissance begins. And intellectuals from the village turn their eyes back from Europe and turn them towards problems at home. And none were worse than racism. And they discover in the problems of racism lies nonetheless a vibrant, vital culture that's being dismissed by the same people who are dismissing black life as part of simply a pathology of a ghetto. Indeed, in their discovery, there is a bit of romanticism as much as there is a sense of social commitment. But the Bohemians begin to see themselves as mirrors, or mirrors of themselves, I should say, in African arts and culture. And they begin to address problems of racism and form new bases of alliance with radicals in Harlem and in the village, in particular around the defense of nine black boys, young men, falsely accused of raping two white women in, 18, in 1931, who are being tried by an all-white Alabama jury, the Scottsboro Boys. And the Alliance for their freedom, which is largely ignored across much of the rest of the country, at its heart were the white intellectuals from Greenwich Village with black intellectuals from Harlem. Ultimately, with the struggle in 1931 on behalf of the Scottsboro Boys, however, also coincides, coincides and gets enveloped in an enormous depression that brings everyone back to earth, even as it would renew a commitment to social justice, a commitment that would place New York City at the forefront of New Deal social experiments that were born in these opening decades and in Greenwich Village. Harlem would recede in concerns, 
but broader social questions would be raised by and about reform. And those broader questions of reform we will dance to next time.